Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out this evening for our third in our um, year-long series celebrating uh, the life and career of John Singleton. Um, this is a screening of higher learning that's going to be followed by a conversation hosted by our very own alumna, Dr. Manushka Labuba, who is also uh, working on very exciting things in her role at the Academy Museum. Um, the panel that we have tonight includes producer Paul Hall, editor Pr uh, Bruce Cannon, uh, publicist Cassandra Butcher, who was with us for Poetic Justice, um, actor Baldwin Sykes, and Stephanie Elaine, who, along with Frank Price at Columbia, had really discovered John and his work and um, championed it for um, future film production. So um, please stick around for that. Um, this is a collaboration between the School of Cinematic Arts um, and of course the Singleton family and uh, uh, John's mother Sheila will be here. Uh, she's been incredibly supportive and uh, we're very lucky to have um, her be a part of this with us. Uh, alongside the USC Visions and Voices Arts and Humanities Initiative who have generously sponsored this entire retrospective um, together with the USC African American Cinema Society. And I just want to welcome up Isaiah, the co-president of AACS, to say a couple words, and then I'll introduce you to Manushka. Hello, everyone. My name is Isaiah Simon. I am the co-president of the African American Cinema Society. Our mission is to highlight and promote art and artists who are invested in showcasing the complexity and sophistication of blackness and the black diaspora. I just want to say a huge shout out to Alex Ago for organizing this, as well as USC School of Cinematic Arts and USC uh, Visions and Voices. Let's just get also, I want to say a huge shout out to my AACS eboard members and my co-president, Caitlin Shane, who could not be with us today. And I just want to say a huge shout out to everyone who came tonight and wanted to support us and support our founder, John Singleton. I hope you guys all RSVP for Rosewood, which is going to be uh, November 9th. And yeah, stick around. I look forward to meeting some new people. Have a good one. And after Rosewood, we've got one more before we wrap up the year. We'll be screening Shaft uh, on November 30th. And uh, if all goes well, that should be hosted by Tim Story, another alum of the School of Cinematic Arts, who made the recent uh, Shaft sequel. And uh, we're hoping he'll maybe pull together some of the cast. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so with that in mind, we've got um, a great night ahead, and let me welcome Manushka Labuba to tell you more about her thoughts on higher learning. What's up, USC? It's good to be back. Um, so I'm Manushka Kelly Labuba. Uh, I'm a researcher, film instructor, and filmmaker. Uh, I currently work at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, um, and over there we are developing um, an exhibit on Boys in the Hood that will open in February next year, so please come check it out. Uh, the lead curator is in the house, Esme Douglas over there, so if you have any questions about the show, you know, please come talk to her. Uh, and so for me, I wanted to be able to introduce, you know, this movie, uh, not only because, you know, I'm working with Esme on the Boys in the Hood exhibit at the Academy, uh, but also, you know, because, um, you know, John Singleton has been an inspiration for me. You know, I did my MA and, you know, um, PhD uh, at SCA, but in critical studies. But, you know, being, you know, a black filmmaker, you know, even though I'm a female, you know, like people like John Singleton, you know, Spike Lee, you know, you name them, like I've always been an inspiration for me. You know, I come from Africa, but like um, watching, you know, Boys in the Hood was uh, a big inspiration for me, right? One of the movies that actually kind of influenced me to actually choose, you know, to make movies. Um, and so I wanted to tell you guys, you know, a little more about Higher Learning, which is, you know, uh, the third film in John's filmography. Uh, it doesn't get the same attention as, you know, Boys in the Hood because Boys in the Hood was such a great, you know, debut. Um, 
Uh, but for me, actually, this is, you know, my second favorite movie, you know, in his filmography. So to tell you more about that movie, uh, Higher Learning is his third film, and it was also the third film that he developed um, for Columbia Picture. He had um, pictures. He had a three-picture deal with them uh, that included, you know, uh, Boys in the Hood. Then he developed Poetic Justice, and Higher Learning was, you know, his last film from, you know, that three-picture deal. Um, John used to say that, you know, working, you know, with Columbia during, you know, that time, you know, on those three movies, that was his equivalent of going to grad school. Um, you know, he actually kind of honed his skills, right, as a filmmaker. Um, and so as it pertains to, you know, higher learning, you know, in terms of what he wanted to do with that film, he said that he wanted the film to be, you know, um, a sort of microcosm of America, um, you know, being a metaphor for America. He wanted the, you know, fictional college campus, you know, uh, to represent that metaphor of America in the sense that, you know, it presents itself as an environment that invites people from diverse background, backgrounds, you know, to come to that place, get to know each other, and expand, you know, their knowledge. But what the setting does ultimately is actually prompt, you know, all those people to judge each other and gradually become a little less tolerant. Um, you might find that, you know, this is a message that, it, you know, still resonates today, you know, 27 years, you know, after the release of the movie. Um, I leave it up to you. Uh, but what, you know, I really like about this film is like seeing, you know, the maturity, you know, uh, in John Singleton as a filmmaker. You can really see that his time, you know, working, you know, with Columbia enabled him to really grow, you know, as a storyteller. Um, you know, especially, you know, in the way he was able, you know, with this film to start for the first time in his career, you know, developing characters that are far away from him. You know, you will see in the movie, for those of you who have never seen the movie, you know, characters, you know, that are far, that are far from what he has, you know, he, he, he was used to, right, from Boys in the Hood and Poetic Justice, you know, characters like Remy, Christy, and Tareen that are, you know, not at all relatable to John, but as a storyteller, he knew that, you know, he needed to be able to tell stories about people that are totally different from him so that he could engage, you know, uh, the audience in his narratives. And you can also see in terms of, you know, the visual storytelling, you see, you know, more sophistication in his camera work, you know, like the camera is a little more fluid, you know, the pace of the film is a little tight. Uh, so that's what, you know, I would encourage you to pay attention to. And then, you know, later after the movie, we'll have a longer conversation with the guests about, you know, the making of the movie. Enjoy. I hope you like the movie. Um, so before we start, you know, uh, with the panel, um, I just want to tell you guys, like, additional facts, you know, about... How you're learning? Uh, I'm not texting anybody, it's just my notes are on my phone, so <laughs> in case it kind of looks weird. Um, so the film is loosely based, you know, on uh, John's experience, you know, at USC. Um, uh, he said, you know, in interviews that what he tried to do through the character of Malik was to capture what it felt like for him to go to a predominantly, you know, white institution. Um, he said that his experience was intense here at USC, but not as intense as, you know, that of the characters. Um, but what he said is, like, he felt that, you know, going to USC was a little constricting, you know, for him at some point. Um, he was uh, one of 14 black students in a program of, you know, 2,000 students, and that's what created that little angst. Um, and so for the panel tonight, you know, I wanted to actually start the conversation, you know, about like that experience, you know, at USC. And I was thinking about, you know, Baldwin uh, over there was, you know, a USC alum, you know, but is also like an actor. And, you know, he actually, you know, met John while at school. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, Baldwin, if you could just tell us, you know, about how, you know, you met John and how you two bonded, you know, at USC, you know, through your like common experience as, you know, black students in predominantly white programs. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored to be able to, to share that. So um, as was stated, uh, I also was a student. I was in the theater arts department and um, also a member of the debate team. So um, a lot of times uh, you would see each other as students just going back and forth across campus. Um, for me, I'm born and raised in Compton, California. Um, anytime I saw someone that, well, that looked like me, it was, hey, this is kind of cool. 
Um, it wasn't a whole lot of us here, but um, it was just kind of cool to see it. Um, and so we did a production every year called Evening of Soul, uh, where we would put together an original piece of uh, theater and perform. Um, and that's where John first saw me perform. And um, another mutual friend, uh, a gal by the name of M Melissa Maxwell, uh, she knew both of us. So she was like, you know what? You need to meet B. And she kept telling me, you need to meet John. And so that's how that came to fruition. She introduced us. And so, um, again, as we're zipping back and forth across campus, now we have a name uh, and, and a, you know, face and um, familiarity with each other. So um, it was always cool to kind of stop briefly and just say, hey, man, you run in the cinema? Yeah. You run in the theater? Yeah. We laugh and just tell each other to keep up the good work. And uh, John just said, hey, one day we're going to work together. And um, that's, the begin that's the beginning pretty much. Can you relate um, to, like, uh, could you relate to his sense of isolation, you know, like not feeling that he had a lot of, you know, people that looked like him, you know, uh, around him, you know, in his trajectory at the school? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I can. Um, like in, on our debate team, there were uh, two African-Americans, myself and another. Uh, he's an actor, too, a guy named Mark Christopher Lawrence. And um, we were the only two. Um, in the theater department, uh, there was like six of us. So I could definitely relate. It was, just wasn't a whole lot of African-American opportunity. That's the word I like to use, opportunity. Um, and I think that's why we worked so hard, because we knew that we were given an opportunity, and it wasn't a lot of us. Uh, it was a gateway uh, for us to kind of show that um, we could come in and, and uh, make good on the education as well as the talent. And uh, we did the best that we could. Great, great. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, uh, I want to switch to um, maybe talking, you know, with you, Cassandra, about like, okay, we start with this, you know, story of like people who come to a college campus with a lot of inspiration and it culminates, you know, in violence. And, and then your job is to try to help, you know, the audience want to watch that movie. So can you talk a little bit about the process of, you know, trying to, you know, make people interested in that story without, you know, feeling kind of intimidated by the subject matter? Um, John was extremely intentional with everything. So he was a lover of media. Um, so he would read articles from whether it be Time Magazine, the LA Times, New York Times, um, international publications. And so we would talk about the writings of certain journalists and people that we actually saw in magazines. Um, Tyra actually was on the cover of Essence magazine. And I saw her and said, let's set up a lunch. I think this is Deja. Um, they met and his, um, the mother and her and John met and talked and found out that she was from Inglewood. So we never forced anything. If you got it, you got it. And if you didn't, we would kind of move on. Because we didn't want to convince or, or like, you know, try to convince you that you needed to see what it is we were trying to share. Um, we marketed his movies a lot like hip hop albums. Um, and we believed that there was an audience that was going to find it. So um, lots of press visits. And um, Patrick Goldstein was a big fan. He was a big fan of Patrick's. But not, and, and we weren't transactional. You know, we would call Patrick because we would love something that he wrote about, you know, John Sayles or something that he wrote about, you know, anything else, a book that he had read and you know, or different things of that nature. And I found that that was, made our relationships really genuine. And we actually broke the glass ceiling with a lot of our movies in that way. That's great. Actually, you're talking about how, you know, the like you think you thought about the movie as like, you know, a hip hop album. And, you know, I know John, you know, like to, you know, talked about himself as like one of the first hip hop, you know, uh, directors. Right. Um, and, and can you talk about how different, you know, the process was 
for you like working with him on this movie compared to the others because I feel like the other movies that he made before, you know, and I think the first project you two collaborated on was Poetic, yeah, correct? Poetic and it's like Poetic has really this like, okay, hip hop attached to it because, you know, one of the lead stars, you know, is Tupac. Well, this one feels a little less hip hop -y, but you still have this sort of, you know, mindset in how you try to, you know, promote the movie. I mean, he was, he was South Central to the day he died. I mean, um, you know, that was where he was from, what he believed in. Um, he loved his people. Um, we never, he wanted to make sure that they loved their, his movies first. I think Stephanie and Paul and Bruce, you guys can all attest to that. Um, we wanted to make sure that, you know, um, that more than that saw the movie, obviously. We took the movie to South Africa. We took the movie to quite a few other places, Australia, I think, Germany, um, quite a few places. But he challenged the studios to do that. Um, and the way we traveled these movies. Um, and people loved it. And, and, and actually, you kind of, you know, um, challenge people to see things and they show up. Um, I think. The cool factor, John was very cool, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was very authentic, so we could get bookings on MTV. We could get, you know, maybe the Today Show wouldn't take him, but, you know, MTV would take him, and BET would take him, and, the, you know, and Char then, then Charlie Rose would also take him, and the NPR would take him, and the LA Times would take him. So I was like, yeah, 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 so it was, one of those things, and then all the talent that was working on the film, they would work, we would work them too, and just kind of everyone, you didn't find us kind of traveling together. What we would do is we would work everybody in different spectrums. Um, you know, whether that be fashion, finance, cooking, well, all kinds of things. And we just take, you know, we end up at, um, God, what is uh, Jack the Rapper, um, all kinds of stuff. We would just, you know, end up there and showing clips from the film and, you know, that kind of thing. And because we didn't have big budgets um, for trailers and posters and movie standees and different things of that nature, we could actually, um, you know, we were at the Bonner Brothers hair show talking to hairdressers and giving them product and T-shirts and different things of that nature. So it was real grassroots, but it was actually authentic to who he was. Yeah, and I don't know if you guys have seen, you know, like any of John's interviews, but like I would like, you know, like recommend that you check them out because, you know, as Cassandra said, he's really cool. Like just listening to him, you know, talk, you feel the passion and it's like, yes, that's an easy way actually, you know, uh, uh, to get, you know, like interested, you know, in the films more than, you know, the trailers and all that, just listening to, you know, like the director talk about, talk about it. You know, I've done a lot of that um, and, and I found it, you know, always inspiring. Um, let me actually, you know, like move the conversation, you know, to Bruce actually. Um, thinking about, you know, this movie, can, can you talk about um, what, you know, working on this movie was like? Because for me, I watch it and I'm like, I was telling, you know, uh, the audience before that, um, you know, for me, the, this film really shows, you know, how John, you know, kind of matured as a filmmaker. You know, you can really see like the skills, you know, are improving the storytelling and the pace of the film as well. I feel like it's it's tighter, you know, it flows better. And I think the editing is really helping a lot, right? And the tension, the way, you know, it's building up progressively in the film. You know, I, I give a lot of credit, you know, to the work that you did, you know, with the editing. And I would, you know, love for you to just, you know, talk a little more about what the process was like, you know, working on this film in particular, and also if you can elaborate, you know, afterwards about, you know, what it was like for you to work with John, because, like, you were like a, a duo, you know, you worked on so many projects together. Well, first of all, I will say, I just feel like so incredibly lucky and a lot of gratitude that I got to spend like 28 years, you know, in a really close personal and professional relationship with John that was like, almost like a marriage. I think I spent as much time with John at times as I did with my wife or daughter, you know. <laughs> I mean, we're talking 10 hours a day for, you know, nine months. And, and it was an incredible experience. And obviously, he was just amazing to be around and work with and inspiring. And he, his film enthusiasm was just so contagious. I mean, 
I'm gonna actually for a second mention daily, something that people don't do anymore, which I think is so important. I think maybe it's missing in filmmaking right now. Because you know, we would actually the night after the film was shot as process, we'd sit in a room together and all watch it. And for the editor, I was able to really well, first of all, physically, John was so enthusiastic. I'd be getting like elbows like this all the time. <laughs> like, so I, you knew what he liked a moment, and you just got a feel for what he, you know, what worked for him, what didn't. And you know, as an editor, you're trying to, you bring what you bring, but you also want to bring the director's vision. You know, and, and that's missing now. And it was wonderful that I had that opportunity. Also, on that film, that was the first film we did on the Avid, which is just I don't know, think that has anything to do with the editing style, but it gave us a little more freedom actually. Mm -hmm. to try different things and more things. And you know, everything else was on the chem before that. And back to John's film enthusiasm, which will answer your earlier question is, you know, we talked a lot about other directors we liked and like John loved Kurosawa and Truffaut. And it, well, I'll, I'll move very for a second. He also has really, there was two sides of John when you study him that he has kind of a, a Hollywood side where he did more traditional films. and. He was also really an indie director. And to me, this is an indie film. I mean, I don't think a lot of studios, and I give Columbia credit you know, for taking it, because this has a lot of stories it's weaving together. If you wanted to make this more commercial, you could have just cut out all the, you know, a lot of different stuff and just made it an action film. And it would be a very good action film. But John wanted to tell a complete story. And John was really tuned in to, as a writer to, to his characters. He was dedicated to his characters. He, wanted to allow each one to have, be fully drawn, fully expressed, and have a full arc. And that was, sometimes that's, it was a problem, because the film would be way too long, but it was just his dedication to the characters. I think that also made him special in who he is. And in this film, in the editing of it, we talked a lot about um, Kurosawa and the actor, um, Let's say Toshira Mafune. Mm -hmm. And in the facial expressions, like Remy especially, and there's also a lot with Malik, we hang on the faces. And this is something John wanted to do. To, the, it's almost like a silent movie. You know what that character's feeling. You know the, you know, the emotions they're feeling. And even Remy, I mean, look at what John did. He was sympathetic to this character. He showed this character you know, as a human being. He was lonely. He couldn't fit in. And it may explain a lot of what's going on with a lot of the messed up people in, um, yeah, you know, now. And now in America. I mean, also Remy, side note again, but looked a lot like, um, what was his name? The Oklahoma bomber, Timothy McVeigh. Oh, McVeigh. If you want to Google yeah. that, it's just <laughs> coincidental. He looks a lot like him. And of course, now he'd be a proud boy or a yeah. oath keeper, you know, the same scene. Yeah, and actually it's interesting. Can you talk about like, how you know your the process you know um, was like to actually you know give you know each character enough screen time so that we would be able like you know as uh, viewers to identify with them somehow. Yeah. I mean, in a way, it was a battle because like the first cut gave characters everything, but it was probably three hours. <laughs> so we had a whittle away, and but John was so dedicated. To, he kept the integrity of each character, and I think it's really there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was one scene that was cut out, which I think was a sex scene with um, Taryn and Kristen. And in some <laughs> ways, which would have altered things, but the film was already long, and it just kind of hurt the flow. I mean, you know, you have to kind of, the film becomes its own animal, and you have to kind of just, um, you want to lose track of the key story. And the music was such a good oh, character. It was, and it was, it was amazing. Danny Bramson, we mentioned, who he brought in as a musical supervisor. And, right, each character showed the diversity, I mean, or the separation, actually, of how each one had their own type of music they listened to, the, which in a way is kind of sad, because when I grew up as a kid, the radio stations would play almost, they, on the same radio station would be James Brown, the Supremes, the Beatles, the Stones, you know, it was all, you know, wow. we were all listening to the same music. <laughs> Kind of, you know, a lot of ways. Not maybe not blues, but a lot of the same. Here and now, it's very different. And John reflected that. Well, the it's music, crazy that this movie was almost thirty years ago, and it's really? so yeah. contemporary. It just feels like it speaks exactly to what's going on Today. everywhere in not just America but the world. You know, and just to think that he was twenty four, twenty five when he made this movie, mm -hmm. um, and how it hold, it held up. I was so impressed when I rewatched it. If I may piggyback on what Stephanie said, 
um, as I was watching this, the tower scene when the guy, the sniper, the first thing I thought about is, okay, when this was done 30 years ago, there weren't a lot of active shooting scenes. Of course, we know now it's every week. Like there's yeah, everywhere. Schools, yeah, everywhere. Yeah, schools yeah. everywhere. Well, there was Kent State. <laughs> yeah, there was like a couple. But that yeah. was it. You're yes. right. Even that. But mm-hmm. the police brutality, yeah. the the white supremacy, like you were saying, it's just, it's very, it just, I'm just always thinking I knew John and how great he was. And then just in, in the years, you just really see his contribution. Yeah. yeah. He was a visionary <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, Paul. Um, you know, you're another frequent, you know, collaborator, you know, uh, collaborators of um, of John. Uh, you've guys, you you've worked with him. You know, you guys have worked together for like you know twenty something years. Um, but this movie was actually the first time that you were producing uh, a feature film, and and so I I want you to you know actually tell us about like you know this first collaboration you know with John you know, in this capacity, uh, and also how, like, you know, you develop, you know, this long-lasting, you know, um, you know, friendship and, you know, professional relationship with him. Sure. Um, I met John um, on Boys in the Hood. I had a company, and I did documentaries, and I'd done a lot of documentaries on Spike Lee's films, and um, I met John, and so the script came across our desk, uh, Boys in the Hood, and my partner at the time, I think the budget wasn't great for us. And I remember saying to my partner, oh, I don't think we can do this one. <laughs> and he said, well, I think you should read it. And I read the script right away, and I went, oh, my God. Not only are we going to do it, we're going to spend every day on set with him to, to make sure we get this movie. So I, I actually met him on the boys set, and we became, we just really connected, like Cassandra said early, he was very intentional in everything. I think he, his mother would probably tell you he was intentional as a young little boy. He was intentional on every single thing that he did. Um, and I love that. It was amazing to see this kid putting this motion picture together and um, with uh, great detail. And wanting to be specific to a, a culture, to, to the folks, not pulling punches in his story. And so I worked with him on Boys, and I worked with him on Poetic Justice. And we really developed a friendship. And one night he called and he says, I need you to come, come over to my place. Uh, I want to talk to you about some things. And I said... And he said, and on the way over, pick up some pizzas. (laughs) And sure enough, I got to his house, and we started eating pizza. And he says, so you're going to produce higher learning? And I went, well, no, I'll produce the doc. He said, no, 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 you you need to produce this film, because I talk cinema with you, I talk story with you, and I need you to help me make this movie. Well, you got to understand, yeah, everyone harbors and wants to do that <laughs> or do something, but you don't know where the opening is going to come. And the opening came with this kid. He said, you should be producing features. You should be doing this. And I said, well, I had to think about it. I got a company and folks, and plus I got to get through the studio, and Stephanie was the studio at the time. You know, and, and a few other folks. And, you got to let um, Spike know that you can't do his next film. Correct. Um, <laughs> but um, I did. I, I came on board to, to do that, to do the film. And for a first film, uh, you know, it was not overwhelming, but it was just so joyous because he was so true. And you could see the growth and what he was doing, and you could see he knew everything that he was doing. He, every plan, everything that John did, he planned. He wrote it down, he thought about it, and so you might think that it's uh, organic and kind of a natural thing, but to go back to how he opened the door for me, 
I'm, a, I'm on my 17th film now. And tomorrow... To, please, please, please. Thank you. <laughs> to, tomorrow, I'm having my mix session with, with two people that he opened the door with for On Boys in the Hood. Wow. John is, was not... He was unlike any filmmaker. I mean, a lot of filmmakers have their same team. But John would see things in you that you wouldn't see in yourself. He clearly could do that. And, um, and so it was wonderful to, to be introduced to cinema, to filmmaking with him. And Bruce is right. Dailies were great. I'd be sleepy. I just, oh, I can't watch. You know, we'd shoot all night, and then we'd have to watch dailies. But you look back on it, and it was like his enthusiasm. His enthusiasm just pushed you forward in every, every aspect um, of, uh, of the process. And so we had USC, right? And the movie is loosely based on John's experience at USC. But the movie was not shot at USC, no, right? That, so can you talk about sure. that, like, please? Sure. We, um, you know, when we were in prep, SC is where he wanted to do the film. And so I said, well, let's go to SC. I don't, I'm sure they're not going to want to do that. But uh, <laughs> let's go. I said, well, let's just, you know, put on a, some nice clothes and go over and meet with the dean. And sure enough, we met with the dean, and the dean said, I love the script. I think it's just terrific. But John, and I, I love you, and I love your work, I just can't make the picture here. <laughs> so John said, okay, that's, that's what I thought, actually. Okay. He probably said exactly that. We walked outside, we hit the street, and he said, okay, we're shooting at, S at UCLA, and we're going to open with the SC fight song. We're going to open with the, the V. Oh, on the UCLA campus. On the UCLA campus. said, you can't do that. He said, oh, you watch me. Yeah. And so, uh, sure enough, I mean, he never, when he put his mind to something, um, he did it. You know? Even in, there were battles. But he did it. You know? And um, in constructing this film, Cassandra and Bruce are correct, and Stephanie and that, you felt it was special. There was a lot of story there. Bruce, you talk about the editing. I remember the first cut. Bruce was three, three hours and 36 minutes, and John said, and I'm not changing anything. <laughs> <laughs> and Bruce looked at me. He said, Paul, what are we going to do? What are you going to tell Steph? I said, well, I don't know that. <laughs> what he said, you know. <laughs> Um, but there, were a lot, there was a lot of story to serve, and he was true to that. One thing about John, and I carry this with me in everything I do, is about being true, being honest, whether it's a comedy, whatever it is, be a, a drama, just be in the real with it, mm -hmm. you know? Make sure it's real, it's not fake and phony. I mean, you talk about the soundtrack. We found Indigale, uh, Michelle and Indigale Cello at a club, and there was this guy performing D Knowledge, who was performing. <laughs> remember? <laughs> yeah, and and no, we we brought. He he said, "This is great. I I see D Knowledge is going. What I could do a film?" He says, "Yeah." So he, you know, he just was had his hands in every aspect of what he was creating, um, down to the end. I mean, you know. Um, and he made it possible for quite a few people that are in the business today. I mean, it, it was amazing yeah. how many people he mentored. I'm talking hundreds, maybe even thousands. thousands. I don't even know. It was yeah. insane. And it was intentional. Yeah. Yeah. He knew exactly what he was doing. No question about it. Um, every movie he made, that was the movie he wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was there was a a purpose behind every single word, shot, everything. Now, th this is true. And, you know, Stephanie, so you're talking about how, you know, John, you know, mentored a lot of people, but the one thing that he said, you know, about you many times, you know, over in interviews is that you, like, he always credited you, like, for, you know, being one of the first, you know, people out there to believe in him. You know, when you read that, you know, draft of Boys in the Hood, you were fighting, like, for him, like fighting the system for him. Um, and, and can you talk about that? Like, what did you see 
in, you know, this young, you know, filmmaker straight out of film school. He was in film school. Oh, he was still in film school. So he, tell us about that. It was his senior year in film school, and I was just promoted out of the story department at Columbia Pictures into being a creative exec. So I was really trying to replace myself in the 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 readers pool with a person of color because of course there weren't there weren't there anybody in there. That's another and, story. And he had been doing coverage, and he came into my office as what I thought to sort of interview for this job. But <laughs> 10 minutes in, he was like, let me tell you about this script I'm going to direct. <laughs> we didn't even talk about the job, to be honest. We just talked about Boys in the Hood and, and, and how it was going to go and how it was going to be and what he was going to do. And I, it was, I, I was just bowled over by his confidence and his passion and his mm -hmm. certainty that this was his future. And I said, let me read the script. And he said, no, nah, no, nah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, my agent's got it over at CAA. And, you know, I think I'm going to do it with John Hughes and this and that. And I just, I went, because I, I went to school in Inglewood, so I knew these kids. And I just called every day until I got the script. I locked my door, I read it, and I just thought, this is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Like, I just felt it in my bones. My job is to get this movie made. Mm -hmm. And so I just went about it in the beginner's mind way, which is to take it to every single executive separately and to talk to them about why I was passionate about it, ask them to read it and talk to me. And uh, at the time, we were in Burbank sharing the lot with Warner Brothers, but many, many changes had happened, and we bought the lot in Culver City, and by the time we got over there, Don Steele had turned into John and Peter, had turned into Frank Price, and we, I put the script on Weekend Read, and everybody who purported to support me didn't. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there just sweating. I was just sweating. I was like, oh, my God, like, the, what's happening here? This is crazy. And, um, and Frank said, well, I think it's very good, and I'm gonna, I, we're going to make it. And I was like, <laughs> heck, yeah. That's what's up. And then we just, and I had no idea how to make a movie. I'd never made a movie, you know, um, but I just faked it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then um, and then we got Steve Nicolaitis, who I knew, and it just we just made the movie, and 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 the rest is history. And I worked with John on five movies, three as an executive, but two as producers. We both produced. Craig's two movies, Hustle and Flow and Black Snake Moan. And as as excited as he was about his own movies, mm -hmm. he was more excited about producing somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, he was there every day, every second, in the middle of the night. We fought, we laughed, we cried. And um, yeah, he was the best. So just for the audience, if you're not familiar, Frank Price was the head of the studio, Columbia, and Steve Nicolaitis is the producer of Boys in the Hood. And actually, you know, um, my last question for you is like, how do you go from, you know, basically producing these guys' movies and then now working with them, you know, as co-producers and especially with Hustle and Flow, which was your first, you know, movie that you produced with your own, you know, like company. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, I had read Hustle and Flow. I, I, I loved it. I had that same fluttery heart feeling when I read the script. And um, I called John and said, I, I, I couldn't get it made, basically. I couldn't get it made. So I called John and I said, hey, read the script. We can make it. This was the advent of digital. I was like, I'll sell my house, which I did. <laughs> Do not sell your house. And... Um, <laughs> And I said, I'll put in 250, you put in 250, we'll make it for half a million. I didn't hear back from him for months. And then one night, late at night, I get this call. <laughs> Steph, I love it. You know, and then and then we spent another like three years trying to get it made until he finally was like, This is crazy. I'm John Singleton. I've made so many great movies and I've been nominated, and I made Fast and the Furious, and I made all these people money, and they won't give me the money, so he wrote the check himself. And then we went down to Memphis, shot it in four uh, weeks, four six-day weeks, and, and everybody who passed 
was there at Sundance when we screened it, and they all wanted it, and he sold it for a lot of money. Mm -hmm. The rest is history. Um, so I'm going to open it up to the floor, you know, in case you guys have questions. Um, I see a question over there. Doesn't need a mic. Hi, Dion. What's up? Hello, everybody. <laughs> Dion works with us on oh, yeah. Boys. Your boys. Yeah. And Poetic. poetic. Um, I, I was the PA on Boys in the Hood, Poetic Justice, and Higher Learning. Mm -hmm. And like they said, John is very, very intentional in everything that he does. And if you look at each frame, there's something about it. You got to catch it. You have to watch it over and over again. You're going to always get something. Um, even the opening credits is gangster. The whole film of this movie, Higher Learning, is gangster. Um, even with the credits shooting in and the music. Well, if Saul, you know Saul Bass. Saul Bass did those. <laughs> who did oh, all the Hitchcock stuff. Psycho. You know. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And to see that, watch the characters think. It's very interesting to see them think and how the music dissolves into... It, it gets you, and 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 what I love is so many different things about this film. It had so many different topics. And each week when we were working, it was we were working a lot. It was like working on a different film because it was different subjects. And when he put it all together, put the puzzle together, boom, we got this. Um, I'm very proud of all this work. Um, this right here, um, higher learning, um, even. The opening sequence when we shot it, I, I, I thought, I'm like, why are we not at USC? I didn't know the backstory of what happened. But even the George Washington, that was Tommy, Tommy Trojan. It's the, you know, the opposite. Yeah, definitely. That was intentional. I, <laughs> right, exactly. Columbus University. Columbus. Exactly. Yeah. And when, uh, when um, Malik's character got beat down, mm -hmm. Right there in front of the police after hitting that confrontation with Remy, Correct. he had George Washington on a wall. Right. So it was so many yeah. different things. If you go back and look at it, you're like, wow, wow. And it raised your heart. Minnie Rippleton song, the whole give me your love, boom, when he thought all that, it, it was right there. Everything was just laid out. So excellent job. Great job. Loved it. And this brother right here, he was hired, he got cast in Boys in the Hood. And he was one of the. Come on, who were you? Played monster. Baldwin I played monster. Played monster in Boys in the Hood. <laughs> Thanks, Dion. <laughs> Another question. No, no question. Oh, here and over there. So you mentioned taking the, the film to Germany. I'm curious how they reacted to the uh, Nazi imagery in it. Higher Learning was screened really, we, we had great experience internationally with Higher Learning. Um, what I loved about whenever we would go internationally to any place, you know, you went mainstream, but then John would always make sure that we went into the neighborhood. So we would go to colleges, we would go to places that we were not on the schedule and actually screen for the neighborhood. So even in Australia, like we'd screen for the Aborigines community. In um, South Africa, we screened in Soweto, not just Johannesburg, not just Cape Town. But um, Berlin Film Festival, obviously we'd do Berlin, but then we would go into, he's like, I need to, where's the neighborhood? You know, um, Madrid, you same know, and the Madrid. same thing in Madrid as well. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I find the honesty. Anytime I've gone to Germany, um, many, in my many films, there's only one movie, I don't want to say what movie it was, and it wasn't Singleton's, that did not work when I took it to Madrid, I mean, to, to Berlin. Um, it was set on the one block, like a hip hop movie on the block, and I felt like it didn't translate. The music didn't translate, and it was just too much of a hip hop story. But for me, traveling abroad, it always works as long as they can see the authenticity and the truth. The you truth. know, John loved August Wilson. He loved the voice of August Wilson. When you think about 
the voice that he had is very similar. I met August Wilson through John. Um, he, uh, I we, worked we, with we, August we, we, after through John. Right. I did a play with August. You could do a course on people that we know through John or, be, or people that got there started. But uh, he loved August Wilson and he loved, um, um, he loved August Wilson very much. He lo and he loved the way he had a rhythm that was honest and it represented the dialogue was really very, he also loved Walter Mosley. Yeah. Walter Mosley who wrote about South Central and he wrote about the conditions and folks and put a real face on them. He was right there in that world. He loved writers. I think he wanted to do an August Wilson film at one point. Yeah, we I were meeting on about. Fences, yeah. actually. Yeah, right. for those of you guys who don't know. Way before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Way before. Yeah. Don't you find that when you travel abroad, which most of you probably have at some point, ultimately when you're you you it's not what people say it is. It's like to go back to your question, if you're if you're respectful, if you're uh, look at people in their eyes and you actually just are honest, everyone treats everyone just as good as, you know, as human beings for the most part. Yeah. You know, I can't you say that's always the case, but for the most part um, I just want to, you know, tell you guys in case you don't know, because, you know, it's college campus, so I always feel the need to educate. So August Wilson, you know, African-American playwright, he wrote, you know, Fences, uh, My Rainies, Black Bottom, um, you know, like two, two of Frank those. Running. Yes, so plays that have been turned into movies. Uh, Walter Mosley, you know, African-American writer. Uh, one of his books, uh, The Devil uh, in a Blue Dress, was turned into a movie, so, so you get a little more context here. Voices were really important for him. Um, there was a question over there. Yeah, two questions. Hello. Um, my name is Tyler Holmes, and I'm a film student here at USC MFA program in production. Um, this probably is my favorite movie of John Singleton's. Um, just the complexity of the characters and the arcs and the emotions. Um, I was laughing, I was in rage, I was sad, I was in love, um, and I really appreciated that and all the work that y'all put in uh, to make this happen. Um, two questions I had was one, with so much complexity within the film, how did you feel? What were your emotions making it, seeing it for the first time? Um, what were the, your first reactions that you heard from other people seeing it for the first time? Um, and then a second question, uh, in terms of editing, uh, there were some really dope edits. Uh, and one specifically I noticed um, was um, a couple times where someone's face was in the forefront or the foreground um, in clear focus, and then somebody else was in the back um, in clear focus. It was like a blurred line, but it was very unique. And I, I was curious um, what was the meaning behind that um, in your edits? And did John have specific things that he loved in terms of editing that you worked with um, throughout your films? It's always really just true to the characters. But you were referring to, I think he, was it called dioptic lens or something? And he used that split once in poetic, di split dioptic. That's what he used. And, and it just allowed you to see clearly foreground and background connecting those characters. I mean, he always was thinking filmically in that kind of way. Yeah. And he, what was the other part of the question? I think? Oh, in terms of the, re the motions and the reactions and throughout the film, the complexity of it, how did you um, feel? And that's a question to everybody. Editor, a little like being an actor. I always kind of put myself in the middle of like, what's this character feeling? What's this character feeling? So I was all over the place, you know, emotionally watching the, you know, working on the film. I worked on the script with him, and um, it was a monster, <laughs> you know, just trying to wrangle it all together. Um, and, and you know, John and I had a very... Uh, uh, argumentative relationship because I was working at the studio and I had to deliver, you know, the bad thing. You go tell him stuff. You go tell him. Um, uh, and also I was the story person. So I worked very, very hard on the scripts with him. Um, um, I remember one time, I don't know, we were, there was so many characters in this movie, you know, it was so hard to service all of them. Uh, but I think you guys did a really, a really great job in doing that. Um, 
But I remember one time he called me and he was like, stay on the phone with me while I write this scene. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he would do that, right? And yeah. just just, just talk to me while I write the scene. Um, John was so generous, really, in bringing you into his process. Mm-hmm. Uh, not at all like I'm the director, I'm in a bubble, but very much working with anybody and everybody around him and pulling you into his world and into his vision. Yeah, he was fun. Yeah, it was, it was, I haven't worked with a filmmaker since that has that is fun and yeah. has has that enthusiasm um, and the attention to detail and um, wanting to make sure those those um, stories are serviced. I mean, John loved the edit room. I work yeah. with some yeah. filmmakers; they don't even want to go come, in the yeah, edit bay. Yeah, yeah. It's like they'll do Evercast or something, and you know, sign on from their house. It's like, what? Yeah, you know, yeah. you gotta sit in the bay and mm-hmm. flip things and it. go through stuff together. That's the way storytelling is. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, um, and Sheila got to read every script first. Mm-hmm. Whatever it was, her. she got every script first. So I do know that. And um, then they would pass it on, and he was like, are you are you done yet? You done yet? <laughs> oh right. Yeah, that was you had to read He'd every you script, script you and you would have to you had to stop to drop what everything you're doing you were doing and read it immediately. Yeah, two hours. Yeah. <laughs> call you back in two hours. Have you are you done? Are and you done? Then they wanted to talk about Can your favorite let's, parts. Let's talk about the end. Let's, yeah, let's break yeah, it down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So people who didn't continue to usually work with him were people who didn't make oh, they didn't the, keep up. Yeah, that didn't keep up. Yeah, yeah, you had to keep up. Uh, Sheila is John's mom. You know, she's over there. Sheila, can you just in the movie too? She is in the movie. Yeah, she 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 makes a little cameo appearance in the movie as uh, the financial um, aid Aid counselor. You know, Kristen. Yes, yes. So uh, John's. You guys catch John in the movie too? John's in the movie. Yes, John also made a little cameo appearance. Uh, a little more difficult to spot, but it's um, after the altercari- altercation between uh, Malik and um, Remy in the room. Uh, then when, um, like at some point, I think uh, Malik, uh, no, Remy's, you know, roommate, you know, leaves the building, and then you have John and another person like walking, just students passing by. It's really brief, you know, Sheila had to point it out to me. Uh, but then if you actually go back and revisit the movie uh, around, you know, like that sequence, you will see him. Like if you pay attention, you will see him because, you know, his face is visible. You you mentioned something about the emotions of, of the um, how the crew and the cast in, in some of the scenes. There was one, um, the Noxy stuff that was shot on stage was so intense and so quiet in that room, you could hear a rat piss on cotton. (laughs) We was just shocked. Cole, his performance, you almost want to, when we cut, you kind of wanted to look at them and like, you know, it was was very, it was, it's hard to explain, but in some of those scenes, it was so real that emotionally, as a crew member, you were right there with the character. You dealing with what they're giving, what they're dishing out. Mm-hmm. So it was very interesting. And if we were quiet. We were set up the shot. We go to the next take. Once we out, we on, we into another scene. We looking for something. You know, the party scene. We all excited. Mm-hmm. But the the track scene. Everybody's all excited about that. But in some of those scenes, they were very very heavy, very very heavy, mm-hmm. and the crew felt it. One thing I'll also say about John is that um, and it's something that you guys should, you that are in school and you have partners, you know, having um, a partner to work with, have, those people become your life partners. With John, I mean, we've known each other now for 28 years. I mean, we work with each other. We, yeah, longer than that. The boys is 1990. We made oh, right. The movie. You're right. So and so what happens is a shorthand happens and you you have each other's back. Yeah. So it's it's really important to um in the find process people. find your people. Yeah. No question. Your tribe, your tribe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um that's going to be the last question for tonight. Yeah. Over there, the gentleman in the back. 
Hi, uh, my name is Lance Montgomery. Uh, this is for Cassandra and maybe Stephanie. I know Cassandra mentioned he kept up with certain journalists, which I found really interesting as somebody that like is kind of obsessed with current events and news. And so he's made a diverse range of films. And so I'm kind of interested like on the front end of each of those uh, that you guys were involved with. How did he get that inspiration? Where did he get it from? Uh, he has obviously has certain uh, perspectives he wants to put into his films, especially this one, uh, like the research process, or because he definitely is a very studied and versed in these subjects. It isn't, isn't just like something you know he just put in there just to have in there. Uh, he's trying to get get something across. Uh, so if you guys can speak to, you know, where he drew that inspiration from and like how he delivered it in those scripts. Felix I mean, should answer she, that. Yeah, I mean, right? he was very well read. I mean, this guy, I, 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 there would be books that literally, Sheila, uh, yeah, get, get, please. Let's give her a mic. Yeah. Yeah, the biggest compliment you can give to me is that John was well versed. He was a reader and he created yeah. interest in areas that one wouldn't think he'd be interested in. Yeah. I, when I see this film, look at him and I just start shaking my head because I, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the dialogue. I'm listening to the dialogue, and I'm listening to what he may have read. Everything he did, he read about it, and he understood it clearly. Yeah. My first understanding of him reading is when Furious Styles said to these two young guys that came into him, "Don't worry about um, the test in so many ways. The math is universal," and that was I was learning from John. I have a collection of John's books that I can't give away because I know there's some importance to him in them. Many of them have been given to him and signed and all, but there are so many books. And Manushka can, can account for some of the things, some of the things that I've kept because he was interested in so many different things. So I appreciate you saying that or asking the question even because he was a reader and he taught his children to always carry a book. I must tell you this. Yeah. Always carry a book, you'll never be bored. Yeah. Yeah. And like what Sheila is referring to is that, you know, we are developing, you know, the exhibition Boys in the Hood at the museum. And so we went to, you know, visit a storage unit that she has with all of, you know, like stuff that she kept, you know, from John's collection. And there's a lot of books, a lot of books, you know, very, you know, diverse. And, you know, like you, you can see, yes, the sort of, you know, um, intellectual, you know, kind of uh, a background that he has, you know, based on his books, right? The things that, you know, speak to him, that influence him. You know, there's like a bio of, you know, Stokely Carmichael, you know, but there's also like a lot of books on, you know, the movie industry, on, you know, filmmakers. So uh, really well read, I have to, to attest to that. Unbelievable. Too. I mean, there would be like, you know, I'm, I would just be like, wait, you finished that book? <laughs> in how many, how many days? Like literally, he always had a book with him. Always, yeah. with his computer, with his iPad, whatever it was. But then also, you know, the Vanity Fair, um, you know, the LA Times. I mean, the New way York. he found the person that wrote the making of book for Poetic Justice, he used to read her in Seventeen Magazine Veronica. and Veronica Chambers. He used to read her in Seventeen. Now, why was he reading Seventeen? <laughs> like he's read Seventeen magazine, which most of you probably wouldn't even know. I don't think that's even around now. But also Essence magazine, she used to write for, and she is the New York Times editor and lives in London now. Mm -hmm. John would call me and say, yeah. "You know." John would call me and say, "I'm going to make you jealous. I just had lunch with Eli Wiesel." Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to make uh, you jealous. Gordon, uh, what, what about when you went yeah. to Gordon Park's house? We had and dinner with Gordon Park's. Yeah. We cooked at his home together. First, him saying how he, during college, he lived in the library. I mean, he was always yeah. in high school, too, I think he, yeah. right? Yeah. He was, yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, we, we, I collect books and he collects books. He definitely. But um, he would call me and say, so I got this thing that's going to make you jealous. <laughs> and I said, he'd tell me what it was. I, I'd go get it. Or I'd do it back to him. Yeah. He truly was more than just a cinema guy. His whole life was... was a life. Yeah, yeah he, he, lived. he lived a very full life. And I think the best word, as uh, Cassandra's used, and so has Steph and Bruce, he was intentional. No question about it. 
I've never met anybody with such focus. intention, such focus. Yeah. From And he could recount when his father took him to mm -hmm. see Star Wars or see a movie downtown. He could give you the exact story. So he was an intentional storyteller, no question about it. And an intentional yeah. person to help other folks. Yeah. That was That's his big gift. He, he helped a lot of people. All the actors, everybody. Everybody. Yeah. I remember being Crew. in Harlem, um, and we were in a little restaurant. It was, I don't know, something with Tupac, and, and somebody said, I want to be a writer. I want to be a screenwriter. What, what advice do you, do you have? And he was like, come here. I'm going to tell you. And the person comes over, and he's like, write. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's just like he was just. I mean, on the yeah. set of Higher Learning, he encouraged Ice Cube to write and direct. Yeah. So people that came through his world, I mean, look at Regina King. Yeah. Regina but, King, he used her over and over again because she had a, a true, real element. She's blown up and she's, she's a director now. She's, she's a director. Directing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if, yeah. you, if you paid attention and it was hard not to, you got some gifts with him, yeah. some real gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Life gifts. Yeah. This is uh, great. Do you want to say something, just, Stephanie? Just never forget him. <laughs> He's the best. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you to our, you know, great panel. Thank you guys, you know, uh, for, like, you know, having watched the movie, you know. And, and please, you know, keep coming. You know, enjoy this incredible thing that USC is doing, you know, with this great celebration of, you know, John's legacy. Um, you know, the next movie will be Rosewood, right? November, if I'm correct, right? So I, I feel like for me personally, during this entire process, it's been extremely inspiring for me to watch, you know, all of his films, right? And, and I would, you know, like really strongly encourage you, you know, to like keep up, like, you know, with what you're doing, right? Keep on watching those movies and you'll learn more um, about, you know, who he was, but also I feel like there's always something that you can learn about, you know, yourself, like something that can inspire you, you know, to do something different and better for yourself. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening.